to Audiovisual Cultures podcast with me, Paula Blair. I'm really delighted this time to be joined by audio drama and podcast producer, Jack Bowman. And he's going to tell us all about his pretty extensive career in all things audio production. So I'm really, really looking forward to this one. Thank you so much to all our amazing patrons, all our lovely, lovely members on patreon.com forward slash AV cultures. Your support is so very valued. If you would like to join the membership, if you'd like to join the pod, you can check that page out and look around our tiers, the different things that are on offer for each tier, what benefits you get. And have a think for as little as a pound a month you can access loads of extra stuff so please do check it out because it really helps the podcast keep going and keep improving and, and all that sort of stuff so um as well as that just before we talk to jack uh just thanks as well for everybody who's been engaging on social media and even if you're not following but you find us and you're engaging somehow hello and welcome please give us a follow you can check us out on uh on facebook and twitter as av cultures or instagram as av cultures pod and i'll be back at the end with some other ways of being part of the conversation getting in touch always looking for guests really happy to hear from from people and a big thanks to jack as well because he reached out using matchmaker.fm which is a website where podcasters and podcast guests can find each other it's a bit like a dating site but for nerds who like being on podcasts so <laughs> if you're one of those people uh but please do get in touch it'd be lovely to hear from you i'm really open to all sorts of ideas anything that could be vaguely in the ballpark of audio and or visual culture i would love to hear from you so i really do hope to hear from you soon Okay, so I'll be back at the end with a few more bits and pieces, but for now, please do enjoy this chat with Jack. I'd really love to welcome audio drama and podcast producer Jack Bowman. Hello, Jack. How are you doing this evening? I'm, I'm really well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah. So, Jack, you have got a really extensive career in audio production in many different roles and hopefully we'll we'll unpack quite a lot of that as we chat tonight but um, I was wondering if you would be able to just give us a bit of an overview of your career and anything you want to highlight any specialisms you want to focus on. Oh okay so I graduated um from university in 2000 and I started a career as an actor um, 20 years ago now and from there um, I had I actually had two three good years working um, but as the work began to dry up someone recommended to me I was a stage actor primarily and someone said uh, you know if, if things aren't going your you know things aren't going your own way make your own work so okay cool we thought all right I'll do that and I went off to write my uh, write a stage play uh, for me, a little two-hander called Frozen, mm. uh, which ended up being performed at the uh, Etc. Theatre in North London, in Camden. <clears throat> and at the same time, the day job was working at the London Dungeon, which had a phenomenal actors company at the time. A lot of really talented people in there, like uh, Matt Berry was uh, mm. there and uh, Ben Whitehead. And also in that company at the time was um, Mario Ronica Temple, who was a, a massive, massive uh, fan of uh, voice acting and audio plays. Um, and she came to see the play and she had had this idea about us, you know, as a little collective, just kind of getting together, creating our own content and just putting it on the internet through a website for people mm -hmm. to download through MP3. And this was the exciting new medium as it was then known at the time as online radio. Yeah. So that's how far back it goes. <laughs> and 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 then in a year or two, basically we were creating scripted podcast content, uh, which people could come to the uh, wireless theatre 
was the company, still is. And people could come to that website, pull down these plays and walk away. And uh, that was my first foray, basically falling into writing. So I ended up doing adapting that first stage play for them. Uh, a few months later, we got a call from Timothy West and Prunella Scales. They were looking to do something with the company. So I was asked to uh, pitch and write uh, a bespoke piece for two of the biggest theatrical actors in the land. No pressure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> second, second, second play, second play as a writer. Um, and then from there, um, it just fell into a groove of uh, writing little bits of pieces for them, 3D Horrify. And that's when we uh, got, we uh, pulled an old idea of mine out the drawer, which was uh, the Spring Hill Saga, which I'd actually written back in 2000. So I'd mm-hmm. been sitting there for a few years. Along the way, because um, my acting career had a little bit of a jump start again didn't last long and the answer will be obvious in a second was uh I, I was doing a play and we were all having such a terrible time I literally just turned around and said look you know what I think I could direct better than we've been mm. directed right now uh three weeks later in popped a script in my inbox to direct spook squad with oh. uh, David Benson in it so mm-hmm. literally it was like okay challenge accepted there's your script go off so I had to learn how to cast schedule um, find the time to you know uh, learn on the job and how to direct a play and then that was my first uh, foray into learning how to work with engineers editors post-production sound design um, at which point uh, Spring Hill started became a thing and that's where it then was effectively uh, a joint producer so I <laughs> It seems like I kept getting moved sort of sideways and up a little bit mm-hmm. along the way. Um, so that started basically, uh, yeah, I went from actor who just wrote on the side to audio producer in about three and a half years. Mm-hmm. And every every step of the way, learning on the job because I hadn't gone through any formal training or any sort of uh, media courses or anything like that. Uh, no broadcast training. And that was 10 years uh, mm. at Wireless. And then we got to 2017 when they asked me to move over to work at Audible UK, mm-hmm. which was studio managing and producing some of the long form multicast dramas like Murder on the Orient Express mm. and The Dark Water Bride and Arabian, uh, Arabian Nights. And towards the end of 2018, this is where... Um, this kind of probably gets relevant for anyone interested in podcasting. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a phone call from uh, Dagaz Media, Fred Greenhouse and the uh, late great Bill DeVries. And they were like, started telling me about how the podcast market in the US has started to explode. Mm-hmm. And there was a massive upswing of interest in scripted podcast uh, drama. And Fred, uh, Fred had been doing it as long as I had. He actually mm-hmm. started at the same time and, Bill DeFries was a veteran of working with like people with Dirk Mags right back to the, you know, like I think the early 1990s of BBC Radio 4. Mm-hmm. So they they all they had a kind of understanding of the culture of audio storytelling here in the UK. And originally we were looking at an idea about how we could team up and do something together. But what eventually ended up happening was that uh, I joined Dagaz for two years and we were developing... Um, and we still are. We would have had a series uh, in production this year and not the dreaded bug got in the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was a case of actually then moving into kind of international mm-hmm. uh, production and how to coordinate projects between two continents and different time zones. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we produced a pilot there um, and that led on. They were impressed enough with the, the draft, uh, Fred and I, had worked together on this pilot called Wholesale Solution. And they were impressed enough to say, look, uh, we've actually been offered this rather exciting gig to create a transmedia storytelling mm. experience called uh, Expeditionary Force Homefront, uh, which was actually going to be, uh, it's a book series and the books are narrated by the great R.C. Bray. Um, but what they wanted to do was insert an audio drama between two of the books. Mm-hmm. Um, so we spent about a year working on that um and that did incredibly incredibly well and that's roughly the point where then um uh, bbc studios then approached me 
and I became a production consultant for them mm-hmm. uh, for nine months. As I joke, I did nine months and four month contract. Um, <laughs> and it just, uh, it just somehow I've ended up, you know, going from just not just like a mere producer, but um, someone who's sort of been thrust into the heart of all these different networks and platforms and the scripted podcast space and, you know, the advances and changes that are going on. So it's, it, it's, you know, not quite sure how, but I kind of ended up in this very blessed position where, um, you know, I get called on by a lot of companies to help mm-hmm. their scripted audio content, do a lot of matchmaking between content creators and platforms now as well. So um, I've sort of ended up uh, being a consultant, um, particularly for the US as well. So, you know, no, no one believes me, the future historians, this is recorded in the year 2020. <laughs> And for the record, I got to the US twice this year. Uh, So, (laughs) um, so yeah, that's that's kind of like you know every everything I've kind of done along the way, and Mm -hmm. just just to say, it's it's pretty much the last fifteen years uh, in America. They say, "Oh, you're a podcasting veteran." It's like I've just been doing it a long time Mm -hmm. and learning as I go, and. just just watching how the the market is changing and particularly how scripted podcast fiction is now becoming its own thing Mm -hmm. which is the most exciting thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that overview that's brilliant jack um yeah there's a lot there to try and try to get into but yeah i was really wondering about that media landscape and there's a lot of scholarship now trying to figure out where does podcasting belong is it something with radio is it between radio and tv and film or those kinds of things but it was really interesting about you mentioning transmedia projects and Mm -hmm. you know um i was watching a lot of the trailers almost for the audio plays that you've been doing and then there's something slightly cinematic about those but it's really just for the the teaser trailer you know and Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was wondering if you had any observations about, you know, because you've been with podcasting before it was even called that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> really from the start, you know, what, what uh, observations you had about the media itself? Is that, is that the polite way of saying I'm old? Not um, at all, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think one of the things that we, we worked out quite early on and I was quite passionate about was uh, because we initially had this label of online radio mm-hmm. and a lot of our media tradition in the UK in particular was because of BBC content. You know, that has carried on, whereas in the US kind of scripted, uh, dramatised radio fell away at the end of the 1970s. Um because of you know that association that this kind of form of storytelling is the kind of thing you would hear on radio for i think it has taken an awful long time for people to realize that um podcasting is a different form of storytelling it's not just a different form of delivery for the Mm -hmm. audio content Mm -hmm. so um i I use a an example that's um if you if you were to put out a radio play as a producer, you are desperate for one letter to come in to mm-hmm. whether it be the BBC or um, uh, CBC or whoever. And it's the listener who says, I was in a hurry. I drove to the supermarket and uh, I had to be in that store by eight o'clock. I turned on the radio and I listened to that play and I couldn't get out of the car until <laughs> it was finished. We all know this story, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now with podcasting, you know, that means that basically what that listener is saying is that whether it be music or scripted uh, dramatization or radio plays, um, they're effectively got a, a bias to treat the sound they're listening to as, um, as potentially as wallpaper, mm-hmm, as noise, mm-hmm. rather than something to engage with. The big difference with what uh, scripted audio podcasting is that the second any listener picks your po- podcast, 99% of the time, they're going to use a pair of headphones. Mm-hmm. They are challenging you to get into their ears and into that uh, that imagination of theirs. Mm-hmm. And that is where I think the last year or two, you've started to see people wake up and realize that it's not just a different delivery method. It's a different form of storytelling. And in, in my book, yes, you could say... Is it, is it radio? Well, I say some of the traditions for the storytelling, yes, come from radio. Is it between, is it, you know, between 
audio and television? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Mm. And there's a, I think I've got a, a, a good business argument why it's not. Okay. If you look at what's happening in the US, mm. I think what it is is it's a complete inverse of the old radio play. Mm-hmm. It's something that demands to be intimate, listened to, immersive, um, and uh, you know, with with some some radio uh, and you know some radio plays and some audio performances, it's pushing the story out at you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think a brilliant podcast story is actually saying, "Come here, mm-hmm. come listen." <laughs> it's it, it it. I think it goes back to sort of our campfire tradition. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense of like I'm going to tell you a little story now. And I think that's starting to make people realize that they need to, you know, rethink things like sound design, the way the story is structured. Um, because, you know, it's taken a long time for people to realize that, you know, particularly if they come from a radio background, that an episode doesn't have to be, say, for example, 22 minutes and 14 seconds long mm-hmm. because that's a Radio 4 slot. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It's, it can be a, as immersive and ex, uh, as expansive as you need it to be. But it's hard. The story, the storytelling, has to put you in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. So that's that's why I would argue podcasting has, and you know, someone is listening to this uh, podcast now. Even though this is, uh, you know, a conversational podcast, it's not scripted in any way. They are demanding that we engage them enough, yeah, to to be to be pulled in. Um, and that, that that's what I think it is. And I tell you why I don't think it sits between podcast uh sits between being something that's almost television or almost film Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the minute there's a lot of experiments going on in the american market where people are going oh we've got this tv show we can't quite get it off the ground or we don't want to spend three four million dollars developing it so we'll turn it into a podcast we'll just you know put some sound effects on it and and push Mm -hmm. it out and that doesn't work Mm -hmm. so that tells you that the language uh, of television cannot easily convert to audio if you just like dramatize the scripts and put some bells and whistles on top so it, it is its own unique it, its own unique art form in that way so yes there's plenty of crossover and i think the one the one point where that is valid is there are certainly think because of the way podcast storytelling works uh, you've got to remember it's in its infancy as well mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. are things we can draw from film production which are valid there are things we can draw from television production which are valid because it's all very very experimental right now but in terms of what it is mm-hmm. it's absolutely 100 percent its own form of storytelling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's a fantastic answer thanks yes um that's because I'm old. <laughs> oh, not at all. Um, no, I was just thinking because we've we've had oral forms of storytelling for longer mm. than we've had written language. So it makes yeah. sense that we would keep circling back to those forms in some way. And now that we can make them in this way and circulate them, and it can be pretty instant. You know, we can they can just be released as soon as they're ready pretty much Mm. and uh, almost anybody can hear them you know there's something really special about that I think yes I mean that's the thing I I always this is another thing as well like um with television or film or Mm. theater you know you you always want to play to the crowd or play to the gallery Mm. or play to the largest possible audience or demographic with podcasting what you're actually doing is you're after a listener Mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. single listener who connects with your material what hopefully will happen is that you'll have one million a listeners if mm-hmm. that makes sense that the, you know there's there's a million individuals out there who are individually mm-hmm. connected with the storytelling and um that that's a really lovely thing when it happens mm-hmm. but you know, as, a, as a you know it literally just does demand focus on one person mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. To, to listen and be engaged rather than say this is this is something you know six people can listen to at the same time mm-hmm. or something like that in a in a, in a room mm-hmm. i think one thing i like about audio 
whether it's radio or podcasting is I can do something you know I can I can be doing something else you know so I'm, yeah. I'm listening and I'm concentrating and, and I'm engaged but I can be doing something else that doesn't take much concentration you know so I can do embroidery or something like that because that's what I'm into um but do you know what I mean so it's something you can be doing actively something else with your hands while you're going oh, what's going to happen next you know and and that's the other thing to say as well. It, it's the headphones that I think yeah. are, are that link. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, there's, a, you know, there's a few podcasts that I have sort of played over over my speaker just because I couldn't find my headphones and I'm desperate to listen to them. Uh, I, I was like that with uh, the Missing Crypto Queen from okay. BBC Sounds, which uh, a nonfiction. If you haven't listened to that one, do. It's it's just mm. like a, stu- a stunning uh, piece of uh, journalism. Uh, and the dropout actually as well, which again is a nonfiction. But when I when it comes to my scripted content, I need to mm-hmm. put these headphones on and and like just you know I've been listening to Sam Matt mm-hmm. by Dirt Mags recently, and it's just like headphones on in mm-hmm. the dark, mm-hmm. take me into this story. Because you can almost see it, the 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 signs and the, the sign design of it. I was listening to quite a few samples of. Of, you, of work that you've been involved with on your website today and I was listening to I listened to the first episode of the Spring Heel saga mm-hmm. and you know and yeah I could it was the signs of 1837 London were just making me see in my mind those things you know and almost smell it you know and it transports you and your imagination actually opens up from just that one sense all your other senses start kicking into action which is really fascinating it is because like when when we started spring here we, you know we were having a conversation just in the cafe before the first recording session and this is where like um, my tradition as a kid was uh, like my dad played me the jeff way world of worlds um and he played me Journey into Space, which is an old BBC classic. Mm-hmm. It was the last radio program in the UK to get higher, uh, higher audience figures than television. Mm. Um, and I, I'd kind of been turned on to that kind of audio storytelling as a, as a kid, anyway. But uh, along the way, I'd, you know, I started to absorb the work of Dirt Mags, who basically has he's been making you know podcasts level drama since the 1990s so Mm. he was you know he was you know years and years ahead of the curve in terms of the way he did sound design and telling stories and audio movies um and i remember just sitting there saying um i think i think we should try and dirt mags this and Mm -hmm. we just went hell for leather but what i find fascinating about your comment is that you know something like an audio movie like spring hill is incredibly layered so there's Mm -hmm. you know it's not just one level of atmos sometimes it can be six Mm -hmm. or seven Mm -hmm. then we have the dialogue and how that is all treated and edited and tightened and and paced up to remove what i call um you know sort of traditional radio rhythm Mm -hmm. which they don't normally pace up the actor's words um or dialogue in a radio play because it's kind of recorded mm-hmm. you know as it is it's always recorded live and then treated afterwards um and that leads to what i call radio rhythm where there's mm-hmm. a line and then the next line and then the next line and there's always mm-hmm. a second of delay because that's the actors working through the cans and that's the brain mm-hmm. um receiving what they're listening to um yeah so spring here we did all that type but you know and then we had layers of spot effects and like you know scrapes and you know whatever it, whatever it takes you know it's just like all that you know in the real world there would be that mm-hmm. but what i find fascinating is that by giving you more i think you're kind of implying it's actually freeing up your imagination mm. rather than us quite as, as loading that with more owl inf- uh, more owl, owl input it's kind of letting your brain go to places that um you know you see what i'm trying to say it's like you're trying to get you know you're saying you could almost smell it mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. All, you know all we did was you know break various sound designers along the way by adding 600 more layers to each scene but, <laughs> so design was. but I, I find it fascinating that um you know that you know we kind of just we really made a beeline to sort of uh homage that great work and um and, and that, that's kind of the response from a listener mm-hmm. point of view. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's fascinating for me. Okay, it's okay. 
um yeah and I, I I thought it might be interesting to ask you about genre as well because you seem to a lot of your projects seem to go from mystery and possibly murder mystery and with an element of the supernatural uh would that be fair to say Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I always joke, it's like, uh, you know, where, where's the explosions? Where's the monsters? <laughs> and uh, where, where's the running around? Uh, but I mean, that that's, that's part of, I think, the tradition of the kind of stuff I absorbed when growing up. So mm -hmm. like, um, you know, it's a, you know, a typical British kid growing up, of course, you know, it was a law, you had to watch Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was introduced to things like Jerry Anderson, even even before you know way before jerry anderson became cool again in the 90s i mm -hmm. knew jerry anderson well uh star trek mm -hmm. um you know all these kind of genre stuff x files not actually weirdly masses of horror mm. um and now you've got me wondering where the murder mystery stuff i mean my mom watched a lot of columbo okay so maybe maybe that's where the the mystery stuff comes mm. from um but you know it's at the end of the, yeah I, i'd say it's fair that i do gravitate towards a lot of a lot of genre based um content uh, simply because it's it's what i love doing mm. and it's the kind of stuff um i enjoy yeah and, and, and as i say write what you know and uh, to be fair after frozen i didn't have many more domestic kitchen sink dramas left in me. <laughs> so um uh you know and also strangely enough i mean some of the horror commissions that um i did things mm -hmm. like intruder and autopsy i was actually asked to write mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. them being my own idea mm -hmm. so uh i mean what i mean by that is that a company called 3d horrify said write us some scripts and it's got to be scary but just pitch ideas and um I think that's probably what gave me the reputation for being a horror person mm -hmm. was doing those o autopsies become quite cold I found out I didn't know this but because I wrote it under a pen name um I was speaking to uh, another podcast a couple of weeks ago and they said oh and you wrote the autopsy and I said yes mm -hmm. right. is that a thing do people like it and like, oh yeah it's good All right okay um <laughs> so yeah I think that's where the like the the association of me doing horror comes from is that spell where I was, I was churning out a lot mm -hmm. of, of those but the thing is you, you need you need stakes you need jeopardy in any storytelling so you know and you know in genre the stakes tend to be higher therefore more frightening mm. so there's always going to be shades of the mysteries are going to be incredibly mysterious the horrors are going to be potentially incredibly horrifying but hopefully that means that oh, Hopefully that means that the thrills are particularly thrilling. So yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. And I think as well, um, because because you're not seeing anything and you're left with your imagination of what people, characters might be seeing or not seeing or what shadows are falling, it's, it, it's, it might be even scarier than what a horror film, say, doesn't show you, for example, because it's your own imagination, and that can be a very scary place. Absolutely. I mean, like, uh, I, 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 I keep meaning to write a blog, and I've probably got to do it this Sunday yeah, before the last episode of Circles comes out, but I, I was massively blown away by uh, a film by uh, Scott Derrickson and uh, Carl Gill. Robert Car uh, C. Robert Cargill called Sinister with Ethan mm -hmm. Hawke mm -hmm. and that is like uh, yeah, I've got to know Cargill since and he's such a cool dude he's like Bill and Ted in one person <laughs> it just just is so bodaciously wonderful <laughs> and yeah so like he did they did this film called Sinister and what blew me away was the fact that it was absolutely terrifying it was all about what wasn't seen Mm. and the use of sound and the use of jump scares is so restrained in that mm -hmm. and it's terrifying mm -hmm. for it and uh, it was like I, I said to him it was like you know you, you know you, you, why were you pulling your punches and it, and it came out as a big r-rated movie it was like mm -hmm. horror 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 and he said uh, well we kind of got screwed by the mpaa because what we were going for was a pg-13 horror mm -hmm. like poltergeist mm -hmm. so we removed all the gore all the violence and we just relied on you know cutting away and jumps and uh, cutting away in sounds mm -hmm. 
you know, to scare you. And the MPA just went, this is terrifying, and slapped an eye wow. on it. And I just went, there's something there, isn't there? Mm-hmm. That there's more about the, the horror of what your imagination mm. can do if you're just pulling pulling those levers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, things like patterns, repetition. Um, <laughs> we were playing with this recently in um, with circles where um mm-hmm. some some of the listeners have started to clock something we've left in the soundscape okay um and i'm not going to spoil it because we haven't no. got to the last episode <laughs> yet um but someone's someone's like going what's that because we were just sitting there and i was doing like the the final tweaks on it and i listened and i went no we just need you know you just need to put something mm. in there that puts puts your your, your, your brain just oh, a little bit off dear. kilter <laughs> so mm. but um yeah i mean it's, it's it sound does a lot more for your imagination you know you sit in bed one night and you hear a, a tap in your bedroom yeah. <gasps> see it started already yeah, or, yeah, yeah. You, know, the, 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 you know people don't like creaky houses no <laughs> but that's just science that's just the house cooling down at the that's end of it. the day yeah yeah but it's creepy yeah. when you hear a creak or a thud mm-hmm. or a scrape or you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. It, I think I think one of the things is it's someone said something cool, which is uh, technically we all live uh, we all live in the past because it, the time it takes for our brain to process what we see, mm-hmm. but sound is almost instant. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's another thing as well that when there's a creepy sound it's just ahead of your eye mm-hmm. and then you're looking for that threat yeah and your body's reacting before you've identified what's gone on yeah interesting yes and there's another sorry just following on there's another yeah. great example from the commentary on the this is what i'm talking about so you can learn things from um film and i think it's when tom scarrett gets killed by spoilers for a 40 year old movie uh, <laughs> tom scarrett gets killed by the alien and he he looks up and he's terrified yeah. as it as it leaps down and uh, and kills him, and he says, uh, "Oh, I I played that wrong because the first thing that happens when you see something terrifying is not to be scared, is mm. that you're awed because mm. awe is your brain's default moment of I've got no idea because you can, you can have a winning lottery ticket, but mm. you're not going to jump out of you know awe is this this zone you go into. So one of the things I'm always like particularly when doing horror or you know looking at those big big scary moments is don't go straight into the fear mm-hmm. because you you've got your brain is working out fight or flight or freeze yeah. mm-hmm. the script is going to tell you what that reaction is for the character but you need that moment because they you know otherwise it's going to you know that note of using awe mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. times of extreme fear and stress has probably been the most invaluable thing when approaching horror work Mm. which is just get that moment where your brain is locked Mm. and if you get that then I think you can take you can take your listener anywhere right gosh yeah Uh, I'm just thinking because I listened to the first episode of circles today as well and um, it's really fascinating how it's done because you're left wondering all the time what's going on what are they scared of what is this thing and it's revealed to you quite slowly and it just Mm. unfolds gradually through this series of phone calls and um so I mean would you would you like to just outline circles because that's what you've got you know that's that's current it's happening right now sure so circles is um a project we took during the global lockdown it's a four-part mini horror series podcast event for halloween Mm -hmm. and it's about a group of friends who have to take refuge in chalk circles because they they took on uh when they were kids Mm -hmm. they took on a demon 15 years ago and due to circumstances beyond the control that demon is back so their their only line of defense is to all sit in chalk circles and Mm -hmm. talk to each other over their cell phones and their mobiles and uh from there uh, is a classic game of cat and mouse because if they're in if they're inside the safe space mm-hmm. how how does that demon get them 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that that that's what's unfolding. It's uh, it's it's a great mystery in like who you, who you can trust, where where the threat is coming from, mm-hmm. how it's going to get to them, and uh, you know f- first clues unfold probably at the end of part one mm-hmm. with the cliffhanger, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, y- you know I, 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 when I heard that in the post production I got chills as well. Yeah, <laughs> but then I thought, is it just me? But um, like a lot of people literally lost over, uh, mm-hmm. over the cliffhanger sort of thing. Okay, all right. I think I think we're okay now. We're on good grounds here. Yeah. It, it definitely had that effect on me as well today because I've, I've, I've listened to it and I don't, I don't know about this. I'll, just, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a go, sure. And then got just more and more, oh, this is quite creepy. And then, yes, by the end of the episode, I thought, okay, that's... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. That's a, that's the thing because we we we're not going for uh, we're not going like the it's it's just all about mm. you know we we're, we're saying come inside mm-hmm. come inside come inside the circle come listen to this podcast mm-hmm. be in your you know, be in your ears but what it's you know what it's actually doing it's not betraying that trust mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's you know, the, the the script that uh, Brendan put together with his writers room. Um, I've been working with Brendan for a year now on another pilot he's got and he pitched me this idea and just within seconds I went we've got to do this yeah I, I can hit this is the thing I can I could see and I could see how it was going to sound mm-hmm. it's paradoxical that's kind of how my brain works I, I kind of see sound it's my weird superpower <laughs> what, what good that is for saving the world I do not know but I, I could instantly see the podcast and it was like yeah I said yes of course, the next challenge was with no studios or no setup or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. It was like, I, I, while they were busy writing the script and I said, yes, let's do it. I was literally running around calling mm-hmm. up colleagues saying, how do we do this? Mm-hmm. So there was about three weeks of research going back and forth between two of colleagues in the US and peers and all over the shop. Um, and yeah, I, it ended up working out okay. Mm-hmm uh production wise um because we we actually did that across two continents and three time zones live mm-hmm. with, the, mm-hmm. with the actors wow uh mm-hmm. and the uk actors were working in the dark whereas one of our cast was working in the california sunshine so it's like how do you <laughs> make horror with that around but, um <laughs> no it's like we, we we never betray through you know because all the actors work together live yeah uh you get that you get that spontaneity and i was actually very good for controlling that creepiness because mm. we could control the pace we could just oscillate things and that i think shows that we we don't you know do anything cheap with it mm-hmm. we, we don't make it go all quiet and do a, a big jump scare or anything like that we're absolutely relying on the performances and the realism which the cast give to to, to unnerve you mm-hmm and there was a lot of notes about awe as well, sure. so, particularly the end of episode one. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Great stuff. And um, yeah, so, uh, and I mean, it is, it is, it's, maybe it's pretty on the nose, just how relevant it is this year, because the, I mean, the strap line is stay safe, stay inside. And of course, there's um, a very big parallel with the messaging we've had in the UK about coronavirus of um, mm. stay home, stay safe and that kind of thing. So there's just this idea that if you stay in a particular confined space, it won't get you. So, um, but it might get you. <laughs> so it's yeah. a scary thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing is like, uh, it, it, this was like Brendan's artistic response uh-huh, to... Uh-huh. to what was going on it's really um, good yeah and uh yeah the, like uh, there's a lot of you know stay inside uh start, start, stay inside stay yeah. safe or stay in your circle um you know we, we're now using the phrase bubbles, bubbles in the stay uk in bubbles, but yeah, yeah stay in your bubble um like brendan was like why can't i said circle mm. <laughs> um but you know <laughs> the point the point taken is that the, you know it's like this whole uh you know you're right it's all about characters locking themselves in for safety yeah. but they're not safe mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so you know mm-hmm. where, where does it go from there that's it yeah that's it great um yeah and so it'd be 
Uh, if you're happy to, it'd be nice to then t- uh, think about the Spring Heel saga as well, because I've got really into that now too. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for listeners, are you happy to just outline that story as well? Because sure. that was when you co-wrote, wasn't it, under your... Yes, we, 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 mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, with Robert Valentine. Uh, so, we st- uh, so originally I had that idea in 2000. Um, this is a fun fact. I was given one of those great big books of the unexplained. Okay. You know, where, um, uh, you know, like, uh, what are grey aliens and what's Roswell? Mm. Um, and my dad uh, bought that for me. And I, I was devouring that and going through it. And there were two entries that really, really fascinated me. Mm-hmm. One was about the uh, the Montauk project in the US, which is a huge urban legend in itself. And I was going around saying, what about this Montauk thing? And so everyone said, no, there's, there's no creative mileage in that at all. <clears throat> Hashtag Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second one was I found um, Spring Hill Saga. Uh, sorry, I found Spring Hill Jack. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, this because uh, I was a I'm, I'm a South London, South London lad, uh, and a, a Londoner through and through. And what fascinated me about this was this was an entry about a mysterious entity known as Spring Hill Jack who stalked the streets of London. He had a 70 year reign of terror mm-hmm. uh, from 1837 right really up until his last proper sighting, which was 1901. And I never heard of him. Mm-hmm. So I, I delved down and I wrote this idea and I sketched out what I thought would be sort of a very exciting ITV 9 p.m. Um, show kind of uh, X file, you know, X files meets the predator kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I quickly realized that I was insane and no one was going to give that kind of show to a 21 year old. So I put it in the drawer. And uh, a few years later, I was having a meal with, uh, with Rob. And he'd read the treatment back in 2001. And he said, uh, oh, but, you know, why don't we just dig that out and see if Wireless would take a look at it? So we, we went back and we re, 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 re-jigged the whole thing from top mm-hmm. to bottom, but kept the core idea, which is basically um, Spring Hill Jack is on the loose and a police officer is out to capture him. Mm-hmm. So it literally becomes a man and his monster uh, trying to, it literally becomes a man and a monster who uh, and their dynamic and uh, it's a nine part we turned it into a nine part um, podcast series uh, which spans the entire Victorian era mm-hmm. and beyond just uh, telling uh, using some of the key events from uh, from the Spring Hill Jack legend but fictionalizing them to allow this character, Jonah Smith, played by Christopher Finney, to go on the journey of trying to capture this monster. Mm. Um, and yeah, we spent, oh gosh, I think two years on and off in production. And, uh, you know, we made it quite difficult for ourselves with the sound design. Mm. Um, you know, it took, took six years to make nine episodes, which uh, oh. was an awful long time. Um like you know we maybe we could have made things easier for ourselves but um you know we, we wanted to stand by making it a sort of all bells and whistles kind of uh, audio audio movie experience mm-hmm. and um yeah so we, we did that for six years on and off and um strangely enough it actually broke into america Mm-hmm. which was mm-hmm. um, amazing. But the problem was the podcast market just wasn't a, th- like, it's not the beast that it is right now. Okay. Um, I always joke that basically, if you can imagine there were 10 podcast listeners in the world, mm-hmm. Spring Hill got to eight of them. Uh, <laughs> but the, pro- the problem is that it's still only talking about, you know, it being a, a relatively small number of people. But I mean, it was reaching 50 countries worldwide. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, people really actually latched on to enjoy it and they they were mm-hmm. very very tolerant of uh, us taking a long time with the episodes mm-hmm. bless them and yeah um you know it was like a, a massive education in you know teaching me how to all, all the things i've talked about that was the one that i think taught me you know the writing the editing the studio managing the casting mm-hmm. the, the producing the post-production the file delivery you know some really exciting and glamorous things and mm-hmm. some really dull and tedious things and some really 
pointless, obvious things that people sometimes miss. And yeah, that when, when we came out of that, that sort of completed my journey from a uh, struggling actor to audio producer. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Cause the, the, the nice thing about that, actually, well, I suppose both of those dramas that we've been talking about is the range of accents in them, but particularly in Spring Hill Saga, because you've got a range across the London accents and mm-hmm. it, it's just, you, and, and again, you can almost see what kind of clothes people were, would have been wearing because Mm. of how their voices sound you know whether they're very high class or they're working class and and all sorts of stuff are those things going to have to be decided in advance because Mm -hmm. um people people like either their jaws drop or they cry for me when we say by the time we got to the end of series three i think we've used 65 actors across nine episodes Mm -hmm. um no they're never doing that again (laughs) um that said he was in the studio doing the 74 actor piece today um But it's 11 episodes, so that's okay. Um, no, so like what you have to be very, very clear and very particular and making sure it's keeping within period. And, you know, there are obviously certain characters like Lord Wayland, played by Julian Glover, who are mm. very, you know, he, he hit Game of Thrones just up. Well, wait, wait, I'm not saying we helped get cast in Game of Thrones, but um, <laughs> it was just before he did Game of Thrones. But, mm-hmm. you know, he, he plays that high status aloofness yeah. so well. And it's not necessarily just uh, uh, about accent. It's also about the attitude you're mm-hmm. bringing. So you've got mm-hmm. uh, uh, Smith, our hero, and uh, his uh, police his police partner, Hooks, is also Cockney, but they have very different attitudes, and that's yeah. reflected. So they're not just two Cockneys bouncing off each other, saying yeah, yeah. like... Um, Sally, like a East End gangster movie, mm. uh, they've all got individual, uh, you know, quirks and, and mannerisms within their, their personalities, yeah. which uh, help with the voice. And the second thing I think we learned very early on, which was really useful, was you had lots of um, supporting roles that are literally one or two lines and they come on and they come off. And it's one of the best pieces of advice I think I'd pass on if there are any actors listening. Mm-hmm. If you get a, a, a line that's two three parts long mm-hmm. just work out what their job is work out an archetype and go with that mm-hmm. have, you, have you listened to episode three not yes. yet no okay that's right i want so uh, this is this is not a spoiler but they they run into um a, a farmer mm-hmm. and the actor who plays him said oh, yeah how do you want me to do this and we just went west country mm-hmm. because that is an accent associated with mm-hmm. farming. And that actor literally has four lines. So play it West Country. We establish he's got a horse, he's got a car, he's a farmer, they're in farmland, he does West Country. Does it does it make any sense that there's a West Country farmer mm-hmm. in South London before it was a <laughs> metropolis? Probably not. But the thing is it's that shortcut just to get through yeah. get through that moment. So it's about sometimes making some clever choices um that you're, you're going for the type of character rather than the accent is for differentiation if that makes sense sure. mm-hmm. uh, when i when i talk to drama students i always say um you know, like you when you put your reels together i'll go through a big long list of things i want and at the end of it i'll say and what's the one thing i haven't mentioned and i go accents because the, these types of stories are not accent showcases they're not mm-hmm. um they're not there to put as many different voices so you know oh you know this character's scottish so i know who so i know who john is mm-hmm. and therefore we'll have to have someone who plays irish because that will differentiate it from no it's um it's it's about making really sound dramatic choices with your casting and your performance and the attitude mm-hmm. Um, and you know the human brain is very sophisticated we can tell you know sound is the first sense that we're born with Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know it's the first one we use and it's the last one we use Um, so our our ears are actually pretty fine-tuned that you know if you if you cast right and you've got different swagger different attitudes and and the, the actors are directed in a way that helps break it uh, just just differentiate and oscillate it the human brain's going to get it and you've mm-hmm. got to trust that your listener has you know really you know mm-hmm. we, we trust that they've got good ears yeah no they do have very nuanced soundscapes 
the all the shows I've listened to so far and it is it can just be very slight differences between two actors that are using a very similar accent you know a very mm. working class uh, cockney accent and the just the different ways the two actors are using their voice you can tell who's who you know I mm -hmm. find and it's just that nuance is really important so that's really um fascinating to hear about I was wondering as well because uh they're so layered uh if you had any insider or anything about the technical side of these things you know so the actual recording and editing processes or even just some of the basics you know, just a little bit of behind the scenes for us for sure so uh yes i i don't do any engineering mm -hmm. to my shame and i i should learn um i don't do any engineering and i don't uh really do i do have my own equipment for recording and i've got portable equipment but um yes uh i have done some um I mean, I've done a fair chunk of post-production. So, you know, when you're, the, the basics you're looking to build up in any scene are starting with your dialogue, once that is cut. Then do they require, because remember, you have to remember if you're treating like three-dimensional sound, because mm -hmm. it's, it's not binaural, but if you know what I mean, for it to be a, a scripted podcast, it's then about voice placement. So mm -hmm. how is the EQ, mm -hmm. you know, are, first of all, are they in a big room, small room? Uh, then it's about distance. So is a character walking into a room? If so, how do you make it sound like their voice is carried? Because most actors, uh, I, I, I don't go with the, the BBC. The BBC approach is to use uh, basically one stereo pair mic in the middle of a room mm -hmm. and the actors move around it. Okay. And that's what creates, say, the, the, the room sound, which is mm -hmm. where people pull away from the mic like this, you see, and I'm rolling mm -hmm. away. Uh, whereas I like to keep my actors on mic and create that artificially because then that's another thing you can help control the pace of say say if you okay. wanted that actor to come into the room faster um, so you'll be looking at all your placements and your speed about how close they come into the ear mm. um, then after that you're going to be once you've got the EQs right on the voice and the placement and the pace you'll then be looking to add the atmos so you know are the outside inside um, hopefully what should have happened was that if uh, your script has said, like, for example, they're in the middle of a disco, show my age, mm -hmm. in the middle of, oh, like a nightclub. Do you remember nightclubs? Um, <laughs> or a pub, if you remember those. Um, that, you know, they would have noticed that, okay, so is it a quiet pub or a loud pub? All right, a loud pub. So the actors should have pitched their voices up. Okay, so if that work has been done in the... Um, in the recording by the actor's vocal performance, then you can start to look at adding the Atmos. So that'll be a basic track where, say it's your pub setting, you might have some uh, wild track of a pub. Mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to this and you want to start an experiment with it, it's a great uh, website called Free Sound, okay. which literally gives away sound so it's got tens of thousands, mm. if not more, sound samples and Atmoses and stuff like that. Um, which you can, uh, you know, you can pull down, mm -hmm. you pull down your tracks and have a little play with them. So you, you mix in your Atmos, which is your general, general layer of sound. Mm. And then next thing is, do you require spot effects? Um, so we're in a pub, so maybe we have a pint or a wine glass and the wine glass is going up and down and we're drinking it. Again, the, the drinking side of the performance, the slurping, because er everything everything is enhanced in audio isn't it yeah. <laughs> um you know the actors will have taken care of that but do you mm. actually need the sound of a glass being put down on the table because uh you might you might not have done foley at the mm -hmm. time foley is like uh, sound effects to work live with the actors and that's, again that's a very very bbc thing but you might be, you know, if you listen to this and you want to experiment, you just might start with a couple of actors recording mm -hmm. their dialogue on a mic and you have to build all this up artificially. So sure. um, then it's like, uh, is a character going to leave the room? So, do, do, you know, and start thinking about the physicality of it. It's like, a, does a chair scrape as they stand up? And a big one that always gets debated, I know it drives me to the mad, is do you then start to layer on things like uh, footprints, mm -hmm. uh, footprints, uh, footsteps? Mm 
uh, actors walking in, actors walking out. I know there's it's a it's a love hate relationship with certain mm. audio uh, drama producers about whether you include them or not. Mm. Um, so so you're looking there at most dialogue spot being spot spot effects being your basics when it comes to podcast storytelling it's then about i think enhancing Mm -hmm. those layers so um there's a good example i think in uh, season three of the spring hill saga and i won't say who those characters are uh but there's a scene where two characters are having a standoff or one is really angry at the other Mm. he's really mad but he's cool as a cucumber to the surface. Okay. You can hear in the performance that he's mad, mm. not letting the rage get to him. Um, and the Atmos all does its job, and you know the wind is blowing, and it sounds ominous, ominous wind. Um, but in the distance, in the, the final polish, I mixed in an alley cat in the background. Mm-hmm. And that alley cat is uh, just doing that cat thing and crying out in pain. Mm. And it's just push right, right to the right. subtle layer of the sound design. Mm-hmm. But what that cat is reflecting is mm-hmm. the inner anguish of the character. Okay. So this is, this is where I talk about it. Start with podcast storytelling. It's about finding sound that can mm-hmm. sort of emotionally and immersively reflect what is going on both inside and outside of a scene. Um, and then you might like with the, uh, like say with the Atmos, if we're in the pub, for example, you've got your general chatter, da, 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 mm-hmm. da, da, going on in the background. But if things get uh, like a little bit tense between your two characters we're following, mm-hmm. another thing I might do is actually go back and I might find some, uh, you know, um, lower baritone pub muttering, which is obviously a slow series. And you, you blend that into the scene. Mm-hmm. So you just add a little bit of bass, mm-hmm. quite organically, as if the the atmos is organically responding to the emotions within the scene. Or it could be that things, it's like things are getting quite heated and maybe just subtly there's a broken glass behind the bar. Mm-hmm. Someone drops a glass and you're using that. I mean, it's like um, finding ways to do that but not say like oh this is an ominous moment oh there's a thunderstorm in the background yeah over yeah there. yeah you can find little this is where i say like little paint strokes like this mm-hmm. uh, and ho- that's what makes podcast storytelling it's where you thought about the fact that uh to reflect that a moment emotionally there in the scout soundscape i add uh this touch mm-hmm. which is almost in imperceptible um, particularly after everything gets squished down to MP3 format for a while, but um, you know something like li- those little touches there, where you're you're building a living organic universe around your characters, that is serving the story and it's serving the needs, uh, the needs and wants of the characters and the needs of the wants of the listener at the same mm-hmm. time, um, and that's where the, the, the path to Mambler lies because then mm-hmm. when you, when you get to that level, it's like okay so uh right what if that character was playing with a beer mat and you're adding the tapping of the beer mat oh okay maybe they have a packet of peanuts now Mm. you see what i mean and you see because because the the the, what what will start to happen is once you uh, want anyone if you're going down this path this um you start to immerse yourself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the better the sound design gets and the more specific, the more inspiration begins Mm -hmm. to open up that, hang on, you know, do I need a, um, someone calling time at the background or do I need someone getting angry with the jukebox and giving it a slap? You know, Mm -hmm. know, it, 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 it can get insane, but you know, when you when you're looking at that, you're you're probably potentially looking at something that's going to have around thirty to thirty five layers of sound, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which you know you'll be probably running through. You know, if you can't afford something like Pro Tools or, or say the, you might be doing on Audacity or mm-hmm. or Reaper, and that's that's all perfectly valid. The choice of a DAW is always personal. It's what people like and with what they can get on with as long as you're always bouncing to wav at mm-hmm. the end most most daws are fine 
Mm. Some of them, if you bounce that file straight to MP3, like Audacity, can go a bit squiffy. So always okay. bounce to WAV. And it's, it's the format you want as well. Mm. Um, so you, you know, you'll be you'll be building these layers and then you know, get a decent pair of headphones like uh, Sennheiser or something like that, that you're listening in, you know, um, for, you know, you're listening to things like uh, artifacts on the track, those little clicks, uh, little, those little dots you suddenly see that can, uh, you know, just destroy your sound mm. quality in a split second. Uh, you know, that artifacts are as bad as a dodgy accent. Uh, mm. they, they instantly throw you out. So okay. trying to keep that sound as clean as possible. Mm-hmm. And then you, you put it all together and you end up with like 35, 50 tracks <laughs> of your uh, of your uh, audio movie masterpiece. Uh, and then bounce it down to WAV. Um, always be editing in mono as well. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you have a particular reason. And this is another thing to do as well with the immersiveness of it, is that you can always be playing with stereo. Mm-hmm. But I think a mistake we made very early on was we got carried away. So there was a lot of hard panning. So some sound will be in your left mm-hmm. ear, some in your right completely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's not a valid way to go because someone mm-hmm. might have, if you have Apple headphones, for example, one side is always going to cark out before the other. <laughs> um, so you potentially end up with sometimes uh, half of your information getting lost if you do hard panning. So mm-hmm. I always recommend, you know, do use left or right but sit on the, you know, you know, sit some of it in the center mm. just in case. And then before you bounce it down, because you've listened to your really super posh headphones, um, the last thing I always do uh, is I always then go and find, I have a, a pair of head, headphones from the pound shop. <laughs> um, or, you know, and I, and I plug it in and I yeah. listen on that because because mm-hmm. you've got to remember not everyone is going to own a pair of sennheisers they're going to probably own a pair of yeah. white apple headphones yeah, yeah. or they're going to you know or they've lost those they're broken they've gone to the pound shop so you've always got to be uh technically conscious of what mm-hmm. your listener or how your listener is going to hear it mm-hmm. um so you bounce that down and you've got a beautiful wav and then once mm-hmm. it's in wav you can then bounce the wav down into mp3 mm-hmm. Uh, but where possible, um, you know, stick with uh, at least 48,000 uh, megahertz as your, as your bitrate sample. Um, we have moved in the last 10 years from uh, 44,100 up to 48. Mm. So I can assume it's only going to be a matter of time before we start sliding up the scale. Because um, Spring Hill is done in uh, 44,100. Mm-hmm. Um Whereas circles is now done in forty eight, and I mm-hmm. think you can probably hear the difference in this in the sound. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked a lot about kind of future proofing that show back then, right. and mm-hmm. the conclusion we quite correctly came to was um, this is something worth bearing in mind if you're mm-hmm. going to make mm-hmm. audio drama or any podcast. It's like the conclusion we came to is, well, that for, that that bit rate is okay because the human ear is never going to get any better, mm. and the human ear says that's fine. And we go ah. Oh, that makes sense. All right, we'll go with that logic. Um, what, of course, we overlooked um, is that it's not the human ear that gets mm. better. It's the playback devices. Okay. Yeah. Again, Speakers are getting better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The headphones are getting better, etc. cetera. So um, there's a series I'm currently producing at the minute in LA, and I believe they're mixing it in 128. Right. Uh-huh. Just to try and keep that, um, that, that potential future proofing. Mm moving forward uh that means masses of issue with storage for sure yes yeah. it's a lot of space um but you know uh you know just just being aware of you know what was acceptable as a bit right because you can accidentally through the aw do something beautiful and mix it down at 22 000. Yeah. it's very easy to do um mm. actually if you do want a quick shortcut and if you're not sure how to use uh like say a telephone filter um, and you have a scene on a telephone. Uh, mm-hmm. Any any professional is going to kill me, but for someone who wants to <laughs> learn how to hear what they're looking for, mm-hmm. uh, record some dialogue clean, mix it down in uh, eleven thousand five hundred. I think is okay. the exact number. Mix it down, 
export it as that and then play it back and you get mm-hmm. telephone quality without even trying um, <laughs> quick money saving tip for you there if you want to <laughs> learn how to do telephone without playing with eq uh-huh. um yeah so uh, you know and again a lot of it is experimenting because it's, it's, it's subjective artistic and creative choices like mm-hmm. you know what sounds what sounds right to you in terms of um you know you want something to be over the phone um you know does it sound too phony or is it mm. is it a phony phone or mm-hmm. is it say you know do you listen to that and go it sounds a bit like radio and i think what you have to do is you absolutely on the one hand first of all absolutely trust that if it sounds doesn't sound right mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. you it's not going to sound right for your listener mm-hmm. that's but on the other hand uh here i'm quoting tv tropes um, there's also uh, an aspect where reality is unrealistic sure. and that's where again what we have to acknowledge is the um, work that's come before us in sound design which is where you know uh, in real life uh, a gun sounds like a firecracker yeah not yeah. like you hear on television or um, for example um, I th- rats don't squeak <laughs> all right they, they, they don't squeak mm-hmm. um so rat squeaks generally tend to be uh bat noises mm-hmm. that are, are used or you know uh so you know a punch doesn't sound like a yeah. you know noise so there there is there is an aspect where you have to um you do have to cheat and you do kind of have to respect the sounds we're conditioned to accept but at the same time, you know, hopefully you blend these in. So a punch that doesn't sound like a punch, but sounds like what you expect a punch to sound like works, mm-hmm. which is literally a rubber mallet, rubber mallet and a cabbage yeah. versus uh, getting something right, which can be infinitesimal, like just there's just the sound of a telephone filter. Mm-hmm. And you listen to the way the voice sounds through the EQ or the way it's been bounced and go, it doesn't sound telephony enough. Mm. Um so yeah i mean that's 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 kind of a you know a little little insight into what mm. goes on in post-production but i mean i, I could do, I could do you two three hours on that alone. <laughs> it's you know at the end of the day you're always trying to search uh, you're trying, trying to serve the story and the ser- story is designed for the ears yeah so you've got to respect what your ear is liking and disliking and got to respect what your ear is telling you it's engaging with Mm -hmm. and what's throwing you out because Mm -hmm. the odds are the best advice i can give is when you're in post-production and you're playing around if your ear throws you out it's going to throw your listener's ear out Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. again this is where madness lies but it's just about getting it right so it's seamless yeah that's so informative jack thank you so much um, I think just uh, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, oh, but I, I think um, just on the back of that, I was wondering if you had any um, advice quite generally for people who might be maybe starting out, but also maybe who have been trying for a while and maybe struggling um, because you've got so much industry experience. If you had any just tips or pointers for people who might hear this, who think I'm I'm really trying hard but I feel like I'm not getting anywhere or I'm really keen to start out on this but it sounds really overwhelming and hard you know what kind of thing would you say (laughs) okay uh first of all is um like the the joke I make is I've been doing this for 15 years and Mm -hmm. it's pretty much been 14 years of muddling along and getting by and now it's been 14 months of absolute insanity (laughs) um because it's now starting to be taken seriously so that's that's Mm. the first point is like if you've been in it for a while don't give up hope people are starting to notice Mm -hmm. we are an amazing form of storytelling if you're just starting out welcome to the club but for (laughs) everyone everyone in the (laughs) world all this i'll let you into a little secret from the very very top for your spotify is all the way down to uh like the, the smallest indie who started yesterday good for you enjoy the journey come visit me on my website i'm happy to help um <laughs> the thing is right now we're so new the one thing is we are we have never been um we're not yet is, is monetized we're not because yeah, we are we're yeah. independent audio we're not publicly publicly funded 
we're independent creators there's no commercial model for there to be us making a piece of drama that makes a piece of money for example and because of that i'll tell you right now from the top to the bottom nobody knows what they're doing they're all trying to figure it out yeah and in that chaos a lot of like in america and uh someone said this is the wild west and i went no this is the second wild west the first wild west was 2006 where we started out and uh, nobody, nobody was taking it seriously mm -hmm. for a long long time uh, enjoying the work but not taking it seriously as a medium so hang in there because things are starting to happen from mm -hmm. around us what you need to be doing is if you like if, you, if you're starting tomorrow you know uh, and you, okay you all right, do you have a professional studio set up? No. Okay, well, grab, grab your smartphones, record voice memos, um, get a, a free piece of editing software like Audacity or Reaper, go mm -hmm. to the free sound project, maybe script yourself uh, a three minute mm -hmm. podcast, uh, a, a, a microcast. Uh, maybe it's, it's seven minutes long, but start, start small. Mm -hmm. Just give yourself seven minutes to, because the thing is, there isn't at the minute any sort of training course to teach you how to do these things. Yeah. There, there are sort of several unique um, unique elements to get taught in isolation um, at various, various colleges and universities, but a lot, a lot of the people in the field are self-taught. Um, so, you know, write, write yourself a little script, find, uh, you can probably find one on, uh, you know, at least 10 in mm -hmm. your favorite genre or your favorite topic uh, to have a listen to and start breaking down you know when you're listening to it what you like about it what you don't like about it um one thing i i, I love and again it's a lovely thing for me recommending this is a book uh by blake snyder mm -hmm. called save the cat okay. okay and basically what he did is simplified um storytelling um, because you've got the uh, oh god, it's on the shelf. Uh, the seven basic, the seven basic plots, which is like considered oh, the, yeah. mm -hmm. the, the 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 holy grail of uh, story and plotting and, uh, and, and writing. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, save the cat just condenses it down and makes it a really light read and changes the changes the the tropes around to make them uh, they get modernise them and make them more relatable. So. Um, I, I always recommend that book for anyone who, who wants to be writing. Just have mm -hmm. a look at that, and it will just teach you a few of the bare, bone, bare bones basics for just zeroing in on what the story is and stuff like that. And if you're mm -hmm. doing that alongside listening to the podcast, you like, you yeah. should be able to begin to identify the storytelling. And then from there, um, you know, when you're getting getting your actors together or they're sending you voice memos, uh, which you probably will be this current climate i mean good good bit of a voice if you can't be with your actors ask them to do their line sort of uh five or six different ways okay mm -hmm. so it's five or six different takes you do five or six different takes mm -hmm. and then start that will help uh start to teach you uh like take selection mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. to put together if we go from um one line is like this next line is like that next line is like this doesn't sound again it's throwing your ear out mm. so you know you start to you can start to um learn how to take select how you know is it is, you know looking looking to find the naturalism in performance so when you're not getting it what you should end up doing is kind of teaching yourself how to direct going oh i wish i didn't what if they'd only done it that way mm. and that that's actually switching on your brain to like if you were working with that to say I like that. Could you do it like this? Okay. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and that will start to train you to to learn to work with with uh, uh, with the with the actors. And then you've got the performances that will teach you post production, and you'll find a, a DAW digital audio workspace that you're happy with, and, and stuff like that. So that, that's that's what to do if you're starting out. If if if. Uh, you've been in this game a while it's getting a bit dispiriting don't worry mm -hmm. trust me um, 15 years and like I said it's only been the last 14 months where mm -hmm. things have uh, started started to change quite dramatically and yes you're probably seeing these big things like uh, like blackout and and the homecoming happen and leaked television and, and the limetown but 
um, just remember those the creators of those shows they all started in the same place yeah. um, and the best thing you can do is just keep building not only do uh, do great work the one thing I will take away from working at wireless was that um, uh, you know Mario always said you live or die by the quality of your work mm. so mm-hmm. make sure you're doing good work you know and if that means you've got to keep learning and practicing and experimenting to find your style and your voice it's like being the author of a book you Mm -hmm. will find your voice if you keep working at it um so from living your you know just just making sure the quality of your work is good the uh, the next important thing is i think to cultivate your fan base Mm -hmm. you know um work on you know there's a big generation uh generational difference between those of us who started in podcasting in 2006 mm-hmm. and those who sort of came a little bit later, like uh, the, the, the things like the wooden overcoats um, and the orphans like David, and uh, David K. Barnes and uh, Zachary's shows where they were, we didn't have social media when we started mm-hmm. podcasting. It did not, mm-hmm. it was MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember mm-hmm. MySpace? Um <laughs> But they, uh, you know, they were very, they came, they, they, those podcasts were born into a very social media savvy mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. And they are absolutely brilliant at building fan bases and um, cultivating fan support because we, we do live in, this is the thing to remember if like you're getting two, 3,000 listeners of your podcast series, mm-hmm. don't be dispirited. We do have an industry wide problem. Yeah. with the medium which is discoverability mm-hmm. because nobody knows how to discover your podcast nobody knows that i mean mm-hmm. a lot of the time it's an uphill battle because like uh, i heard a phrase in the uh, radio today pushing water uphill that's what it's like to get a, a podcast out there particularly in the independent sector because there's there's, there's no magic algorithm there's no like netflix Mm-hmm. code for like saying oh you like the wooden overcoats come and try this podcast yeah. um so that that's the second thing and so don't be dispirited because it's it's not your fault that people may have discovered your podcast mm-hmm. it's the fault of the podcast ecosystem mm-hmm. um that hasn't been fixed yet so i i, I will make a prediction that two to three years from now because you know i've had some conversations with uh, people in America and, and Europe, etc. They all now agree that the scripted podcast fiction space is the next thing that needs to happen. Mm. It has to happen, but the two fundamental challenges are discoverability and monetization. Now, best of all in the world, if uh, you know, if I was good at monetization. I would have made money on my podcast right now. <laughs> and I th- you know, a lot of independent creators of, uh, they just want to tell good stories. Mm-hmm. That's what drives them. We, we don't know how to fix that problem. I have a feeling, given what's going on at the top end of the US right now, one of those big three players mm-hmm. will find a way to fix it. Mm-hmm. The other side is discoverability. And I've got a feeling one of those three players will fix it. Mm-hmm. Because there's now too much going on in the US market for this just to still, still be random, yeah. if that makes sense. If they want you uh, to sit down and watch the next big television show, mm-hmm. they go out of their way to make sure you know that television sh- show exists. So there's no way that they're going to have this market where it's uh, like a gold mine for new ideas, new IP, mm-hmm. you know, especially since lockdown, more celebrities have wanted to get involved with yeah. podcasting on the scripted okay. and non-scripted side. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, now, now that turning point has been reached where big to A-list talent want, mm-hmm. want, all want their own podcast series. It's only going to be a matter of time before the pressure is there is fix that problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um so I can see two to three years from now that um, we're, we're going to be at a point where one of those two problems gets solved. And if you're making content, just hang in there because once it's cracked for one po- once it's cracked for one podcast, it's going to crack it for the entire ecosystem. I hope so. <laughs> uh, me too, because it's like people people say, yeah. "Have you heard this podcast?" It's like I didn't even know it existed. Do you know, know what I mean? It's exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. It's it's really infuriating that. Um, I know a lot of good content goes by 
and sometimes I catch up with it. I mean, this is a really good example, but I, I love cinema scenes. Okay. Which uh-huh. is a, a fascinating thing. Again, if you're interested in storytelling, watching mm-hmm. them nitpick everything apart, yeah. now, even something like Citizen Kane. It's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, okay, you know, and I, I now actually went, all right, go, that's a cinema scene, delete. Um, but, you know, they turned around last year and said, oh, did you know we've got a podcast? And I went, you have a podcast? Mm. Okay. And it started in 2016. Nice, I didn't know So it's that. three mm. years that one of my favorite YouTube channels had yeah, a podcast yeah. and I didn't know. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange old time. But, I mean, the, the best thing you can be doing right now, mm-hmm. despite these problems, as I said, is just make really good quality work. Yeah. Um, because that is the thing you know there's you know if you were like um an indie film director and you made a hit low budget movie Mm -hmm. let's take scott derrickson for example with sinister he's in like he makes a really great with uh, with cargo and makes a really great low budget horror indie and then he's moved up and given a big studio movie Mm -hmm. and eventually he's there then directing doctor strange Mm -hmm. and they're working on that as a team doing doctor strange for marvel um so you can see there's a logical progression there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the thing with scripted podcasting storytelling is all you can do at this stage is literally just make sure your last podcast series is high quality work mm-hmm. because it's not necessarily about being a commercial hit mass audience etc like that it's got to be quality storytelling and to use that terrible phrase that's what you've got to leverage to keep moving forward so mm-hmm. um just just make sure you're doing great work good storytelling using the medium um you know pushing yourself to to tell that story to immerse and entertain and you know get as as in you know make it as uh as an engaging and internal process between in this in, as fred greenhouse would say the 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 uh the theater of your mind mm. you know um and that that is what will help you step up because if you just keep making series after series which is good and a great listener experience in the podcast space you don't necessarily need to worry about something being a huge hit Mm. because people understand that kind of model doesn't exist yet Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. two three years from now it might but just just be really focusing on telling great stories yeah oh that's brilliant advice Um, Is there anything else that you would like to say that you feel we haven't covered yet? Um, Well, good question, uh, because I talk a lot, as you can tell. Uh, So, um, no, I mean, like like I say, just just remember this uh, this is a it's 2020 right now. And I genuinely think this decade ahead, particularly for scripted audio fiction, is it's going to be the game changer. Okay. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that the uh, I've done a couple of talks uh, for Podfest this year, and the last one I did was the fact that uh, there's all this terribleness going around the whole world right now, mm. you know, and all this this stress and, and worry and fear. So a couple of things come out of that, which is one, um, you know, it, it film, television, theatre is all you know at a standstill, ground to a hall in a bottleneck right now. Mm. So audio drama is a, now becoming a very, very good place to, mm. to find the entertainment. Um, but my, my, I think the best advice I can give if you're looking to create audio content from this point here on in, I'm going to say one word, and it might seem counterproductive to where we're all at right now. Fun. Aww. make it enjoyable because um we we had like i said we had a series fred and i we did the pilot on wholesale solution and we built the writer's room on the 15th of march mm-hmm. lockdown start I, I then flew back from florida lockdown started in the uk nine days later mm-hmm. um and then after that we had a regroup and we went we, we think the world is just too depressing for a dystopian science fiction horror series mm. and that was a big moment when we were sitting there going yeah i think it's time for uh it, it's time you know for some fun mm-hmm. because the, it's got to the point i think where this experience is right now in the world it you know people are they, they you know they don't want more misery 
yeah. piled on top of misery with their entertainment. So um, I, I've done a complete pivot on what I'm putting forward to make okay. make it fun. Mm. I think I think people will, will come out of this year and, and people will start enjoying comedies and wanting things that are a bit more. I'll be actually, you know, as Rob used to say, a great barometer of culture, is, uh, uh, how culture is feeling, mm. is about how in tune a Bond movie is right. with its audience at the time. So, <laughs> Di- so Die Another Day, for example, mm. came out, uh, was in production during 9-11 okay right. so when that came out it was all mm. about super villains and windsurfing and it fell out and then that's the same year that uh, 24 came out mm. yeah and i'll be very curious to see how um no time to die lands with audiences mm. now because yeah. it's probably going to be a little bit gritty very serious daniel craig one movie because yeah. that's what they are they're gritty and they're serious and just 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 watch that one see how that one's received mm. when they finally release that film next year in the current climate i think i think you'll see that basically the next bond will actually be closer to roger moore that's my <laughs> that's my that's my top prediction there uh, a bit more spy who loved me rather than uh, the living daylights yeah. so fun keep, yeah. keep that in mind yeah i i really hope you're right yes we need more joy <laughs> And I think it will come because I think yeah. this year is like it's just accelerated the the sort of the pain and the misery a little bit. And uh, you know, I'm not saying we're out of the woods yet with mm-hmm. where we're at uh, as a as a planet or individual societies, uh, wherever we are. But um, I, I do think there's going to be a, a swing towards um, needing lighter entertainment. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, and I don't mean that as in variety. What I mean is it's, you know, we'll, we'll steer away from dystopia, which we've mm. had years of. We'll steer away from grim, end of the world kind of stuff. Uh, because, you know, we, we, we've had a dress rehearsal for once. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, some hope. Where, where, yeah. Where, where we're <laughs> at a year from now, we, we shall see. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Jack. Thank you so very much. No worries. It's been yeah. it's been lovely to talk. And um, just just one last thing to say: if anyone mm. is interested in following up, uh, you can go to my website. There's yeah. a contact form. I'm always happy to give advice to anyone who's looking at their scripted podcast uh, sector, um, and that's www.jackbowman.net. Um, and go to the contact form, and that goes straight to me. Ignore the thing about um, agents; it does come to me. It's mm-hmm. just if someone says we work, I send it on. Um, but yes, if, if anyone's looking for advice or guidance or any help, uh, more than happy to to just have a conversation. And uh, the more people we get into audio fiction in the podcasting space, the better. So, uh, <laughs> yay, let's make that happen. Yeah. And it, it is a friendly bunch as well. I think we all like to mm. try and help each other because we're all struggling a bit, no matter where in the strata you are. We're all trying to, I, I feel like we're all trying to pull each other up. So Absolutely. Because yeah. like um, uh, as a, a friend a friend of uh, Builder Fries came over to the UK, uh, Joe Dooley, and he said to me, uh, rising tide lifts all boats. Yes. And it's <laughs> absolutely true. And that, that plays into the fact, if you look at the work, say, that uh, Ella Watt, has been doing for the mm. last two years and like getting the community sort of mobilized and that, that's that's a nice thing to remember as well mm. that uh yes people are you know we, we we're, we're an industry but we're still quite at that community level and i you know i've been talking to various networks and commissioners and quite a few of them have sort of said on the qt it's like mm. uh, look, um, you know what we've got to figure this out because we love it and I don't care if we're a rival to that network, but mm-hmm. you know, we can actually just sort of softly ally for a five or six years, and then yeah. you know, once it's all fixed, then we can be bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> That's what rivals. <laughs> and you've got to think about it. If the networks are thinking about it at that level, yeah, then we absolutely should be reflecting that as a as a as a community That's it. Of, of, of podcast creatives. Um, you know, we've got to look. We do have to look out for each other because, like I say. It can feel, uh, trust me, I, I know that for many, many years you'd throw podcasts out and you wouldn't even know if you connected with an audience. Mm-hmm. We, did, we didn't know if Spring Hill was connecting for people for a long, long, uh, with people for a long, long time. Yeah. So, you know, um, just, you know, 
that's that's the other thing. It can feel quite lonely, but mm. you know, we we we're fast becoming a community. We're fast, you know, organized. You know, and that community is now becoming global, mm. which is lovely. Mm. Um, so the get-togethers that oh, I, I miss it. There was a monthly get-together Ella used to organize uh, in South London. Mm. Um, you know, I, we, I, I miss that physical community, but we're, we're all still there. We're all still at a touch of a button. So, um, you know, stick together, keep keep an eye on each other's backs and, and do great work and help yeah. each other. Brilliant. That's, that's a lovely, it's the perfect place to leave it. So. <laughs> Thank you so and much. And another thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brilliant. So you mentioned your website. Do you have any socials or anything you want to just point? Uh, yeah, towards? yeah, sure. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Real Jack Bowman. And if you're interested in listening to Circles, mm-hmm. you can find that on Twitter, uh, which is Here Circles. It's on Instagram as well. That's mm-hmm. where social media left me behind. In- Insta, what now? Uh, Instagram is here circles, uh, Twitter is here circles, mm-hmm. and if you want to find that on Facebook, it's Circles Podcast. Okay, uh, it's highly recommended. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks and, very much. Yeah. And ser- ser- series finale this Sunday. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That's great. No worries. Thank you very much. been a cozy pea pod production with me paula blair and my very special guest jack bowman the music has been common ground by airtone licensed under a 3.0 non-commercial attribution and it's available for a download from ccmixer.org do check out that website it's got loads of cool stuff and uh, all of the other stuff has been done by me i've been editing and we're doing the recordings and all of that stuff And uh, if you would like to support the podcast, but you're not too sure about a membership, you can drop me a fiver at buymeacoffee.com forward slash BEA Blair, because that just goes towards all of the work that I'm doing with the podcast and writing and other bits and pieces as well. And it's hugely, hugely appreciated all your support. And as well as the social media that I gave out earlier in the episode, you can get in touch by emailing audiovisualcultures at gmail.com if you want to chat about being a guest on the show or if you've got an idea for a show that you'd like to run past me, something you'd like to hear us do. We're really grateful if you don't want to give money, but if you want to gift something. So if you want to send me a DVD to watch or you want to... Um, send me a link to a film that you want me to see or whatever it happens to be Uh, just uh, just just give me a shout that way or you can find us on the socials Uh, so yes huge thanks for listening huge thanks for engaging do keep it up it just means so much and I hope these episodes have been really really useful it's been amazing hearing about people's experiences with their lockdown creativity as well so if you have a story uh, you don't have to be a professional just get in touch because it's all part of that fabric that network of just cultural production and that's what I'm really really interested in and that we can all learn from together Okay, so take care of yourselves, be excellent to each other as always, and I will catch you next time.